All right. So Bitcoin is at a yearly low. Currently, it's at 16,700. There's blood in the streets. And, you know, what does this say? Um, I think that, you know, it's the, the whole economy is really collapsing all over the world. There's a liquidity crunch everywhere. We just saw FTX is basically screwed. They're, they're holding customer funds. So if you had your, your crypto in the FTX exchange, they're not even letting you withdraw. It's sort of the same thing that happened with Celsius. And it's because they were trading people's money mm. without even telling them. And, you know, now that's rippling through the market. And uh, yeah, it's not your, not your keys, not your coins, boys. Yeah, you can't keep your crypto on the, on the exchanges anymore. It's just not safe. I mean, what's next, Coinbase? You know. Better not be. And you had Brian Armstrong, CEO of Coinbase, saying, you know, reiterating yesterday that they don't trade anybody's money and that this is something that they're very strict about. But, you know, that's what everybody says. So I think that Coinbase and Binance are, you know, most likely more, more trustworthy. But you, you cannot trust these exchanges. You know, you no. need to store it on your own, on your own crypto wallet. And, you know, it's sort of like the crypto economic equivalent of, uh, of censorship. I mean, it's like, imagine having all your money or, or like a run on the banks, you know, or a bank just stealing your money. Yeah. It's not cool. I, I'll take the, I'll take the uh, boomer perspective here. Um, what would you guys suggest as far as wallet at this point? Like for someone that's new getting into crypto, like what? what is going to be kind of the easiest way for someone to break into this? It's totally fine to use exchanges like to buy and sell crypto. But, you know, when you're just storing it, you know, for Ethereum, for instance, like you can use MetaMask, you know, because you control those keys. You can use Ledger or, you know, a different hardware wallet um, for Bitcoin and Ethereum. And, and, and no other party can take your coins you have the key to it nobody else does it's it, it's definitely confusing it's good that you're asking that question sean because you know there's a, there's a huge learning curve to this stuff and even understanding like what is a key you know what that even means it takes time to understand it and the reality is that if you're it, it's the difference between storing your gold in your own safe versus storing it in some custodian or like some some bank or something it's like okay. either you're the only one with the keys or you're letting someone else have the keys too and they're and who are trading your money and using it and potentially losing it so i mean they're not all necessarily doing that but yeah you risk that being happen you risk that occurring when you give up custody all right oh okay so that's what you're saying by trading money that means that you know, if you went with VTX or if you went with, you know, one of these companies, they also have the ability to then take your savings and potentially gamble it. That's what they do. That's what that, okay. that's what's been happening. Yeah. OK, because I have so, MetaMask. So, that just, it's in MetaMask. No, MetaMask doesn't do that. MetaMask doesn't have anybody's funds. They just you know, that's a, a wallet that you have your keys, you store it and no one can mess with it. Gotcha. So, you know, I think that all of this just follows the the liquidity crunch going on globally. I mean, right. People uh people need to protect themselves and you're just seeing like you know, markets markets are panicking and <clears throat> it's 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 hard to say where this is going to go. I think that we've got more pain ahead. The other, so, the other, yeah. the other interesting thing about the FTX situation was like Binance's inclusion in the whole story, and like apparently, like I think some somewhere like so there's Alameda Research, which is like I, I'm not, I think it's like a sister company or something. A hedge fund, okay. yeah, it's, it's yeah, it's like have fun. Something got leaked of like their balance sheet, and it basically showed that like they were like really heavily relying on FTT, which is like the FTX like token that they use. So a lot of their balance sheet was like relying on the liquidity from there. And 
I think the Binance CEO had like an enormous holding of FTT and he basically like, he basically like orchestrated it was like, it was kind of like a, like a takeout. Like he basically sold all of their FTT, which sent the whole price of FTT like crashing to the ground, which made all of the people who own FTT start panicking and selling. So mm-hmm. he kind of like created a liquidity crunch with the FTT, which FTX was using as like kind of their liquidity collateral. solution. And they were using collateral. it as collateral for, for a bunch of stuff that for, they were. Yeah. You know, and then so, so so then you know the Binance guy CZ comes to the rescue saying he's going to buy them and bail them out and now and now he's saying he might not even buy them it's the deal's not closed it's like I, I think he's he's considering back he's playing game but he seems it was a to bit be, of a yeah he, he seems to be a couple chess moves ahead of uh, Bankman Fried and well, yeah everybody really loved that SBF guy he was kind of the media darling ever. Tom Brady put like seven hundred million dollars into FTX, I think. So like, Whoa. it's not it's not good. A, a lot of people put a lot of faith in that guy. And Tom Brady has seven hundred million to throw into a new. Uh, are you? I don't know that. that I'm gonna have to fact check. Part of a round. Maybe he was part of a round. He, he, he's heavily invested in in FTX, I believe. In Dude, there was there was stadiums well. named after FTX. Sam Sam. Yeah, Bay they did like a Super Bowl ad. I'm pretty sure. They did a Super but, Bowl ad. Yeah. They also, uh, you know, Sam was on Sam Harris's podcast talking about uh, effective altruism, which is this whole like, you know, sort of idea of people giving, you know, passively to charities and just committing a certain percentage of their of their salary or earnings or net worth to to charity. And, you know, because he, he is legitimately a very smart guy and just got arrogant it seems but you know if he was trading customers funds without being transparent particularly after what happened to celsius and for anyone who doesn't know like celsius coinbase um ftx binance you know you've heard of these names where you can like go and buy crypto and and, you know just what you need to be aware of is that some of them do have these shady trading pack practices behind the scenes and they're putting users funds at risk so um, it's not good. You know, CZ may have some master plan to take out a competitor with this, but what's happening now is that Bitcoin, you know, which is the, the big daddy of the market, the grandfather is, you know, hitting lows of the year. And that could cause other big players, for instance, mining facilities to go under because suddenly they're not breaking even because the Bitcoin that they're mining is now worth less. And then you start to see this cat, these cascading liquidations. And like, if you look back at 2008, it's, you know, market collapses typically happen when, you know, these, these cascading liquidations start occurring because you have banks or, you know, whether it's a crypto bank or a regular bank, what they're all doing is trading against collateralized risky collateralized assets so you know in 2008 it was the um you know subprime mortgage packaging and you know there were basically these garbage securities that people were trading against that were actually worth nothing but they were being claimed to have this really high value and it's very similar to what's happening in crypto now so it's it's just an echo in you know with new tools these days but for everyone listening like this doesn't mean that Bitcoin itself is any less valuable or important. Bitcoin is doing what it's always done. Overall, for the past decade, it's been an absolute rocket ship. And Bitcoin is a totally trustless, decentralized system. It's never been hacked. There's never been anything sketchy with Bitcoin. There's only been s- sketchy stuff, which essentially Bitcoin banks have done with Bitcoin and then that has an impact on the crypto and Bitcoin market because, you know, when huge funds are getting liquidated for millions of dollars, it, you know, everyone rushes to go shell, sell. And then that creates downward pressure on the market. Interesting. Inter- yeah. And Jack, yeah, you're right. Tom Brady's in kind of a lot here. I, I don't see a number here, but yeah, he's definitely heavily invested. Um, well, they, I mean, they've raised like, Wait, what is they raised like 
four hundred million. FTX raised four hundred million this year. <laughs> wow. So, so it's like yeah, Sequoia, how, Sequoia Capital, one of the biggest venture te- tech stock ven- bank venture too. Companies. Like it's yeah, like, like big the, players the, put money into them. Yeah. So you know, it just shows like you know you got to be careful with some of these like not transparent centralized groups. Uh, that's just shows why the transparency matters, and that's why a lot of these other exchanges are starting to have to like they're wanting to like show more proof of like what their liquidity is reserve. kind of yeah proof mm-hmm. of reserves and like prove that they have liquidity and not that it's like awesome sham so anyways that's it's pretty it's pretty sad news in the crypto world that you know the guy that everybody kind of liked was just kind of full well of it. yeah it, because you know with with regulators obviously you know now we see that the sec is investigating ftx it just creates this bad taste in everybody's yeah. mouth because you, because yeah. the people who get screwed by this are just retail investors. You know, imagine, imagine a couple years ago, you know, during the pandemic, you spent a couple thousand bucks on some crypto and then you just can't get it. I mean, that is like, you would have thought that the industry would have learned lessons from, you know, the early days. There was this big collapse of this exchange called MT Gox. And then now it, it's like a meme. And it, it just keeps happening. So, you know, not your keys, not your crypto. Yeah. No, so wait, wait, before we get off this topic, Bill, do you suggest people still invest in crypto? That's always the question. I mean, I'm not, in, I'm not, I'm not suggesting, you know, on the record any, right now, you can never change your mind. No, I mean, I believe in, in crypto as, you know, future infrastructure of you know finance and communications but i'm not like you know i'm definitely not in the business of making suggestions i'm i'm no expert on it yeah. um but yeah. i still i still believe in the underlying technology but i think that what happens is people get confused between the underlying they think that they go to an exchange and buy bitcoin but they're actually going to an exchange and buying Bitcoin for an exchange to hold. So what you need to do is go to an exchange, get the Bitcoin, and then you have to send the Bitcoin to your own wallet on like a ledger or something like that. Then at least you can bury it in your backyard and come back to it a decade later. And, you know, hopefully the market will have worked itself out by then. It makes sense. So, makes sense. Yeah. Crypto, yeah so, <clears throat> sorry, crypto. It's still not decoupled from the macroeconomic scene. And with the rest yeah. of the market crashing, it was pretty much predictable that crypto was going to go even further down. I follow a commentator, like an economist and a Bitcoin expert, Gareth Soloway. And he's of the opinion that Bitcoin could, might go down as low as like 7,500 7, and Ethereum as low as like 200. That's his prediction. He's been pretty dead on for the last like five years in terms of Bitcoin predictions. But yeah. So, yeah. so speaking, speak, speaking of not being experts, so we had the uh, the election last night. And one thing that kind of popped out to all of us was kind of how the the younger generation voted. There's been some like uh, people guessing and saying, you know, Gen Z is going to rebel against like the millennials and, and their values. Um, and, you know, you saw some evidence with like meme meme stirs and things like that. Um, but, you know as you can kind of see here, the younger generation heavily voted Democrat, which was kind of a shock to me. I don't know about you guys. No, I wasn't shocked about it at all. You know, you see how the younger generations, I mean, I'm, I'm coming from Vermont and I was talking about this on the quite frankly podcast with Bill, but there's a school in Vermont, a high school where the students were protesting that the mask mandate had been lifted. They, they weren't protesting that they had to wear masks. They were protesting that they suddenly didn't need to wear masks anymore. You know, and so mm. like, this is where the mindset of the youth is at. I mean, you know, the youth has notoriously been brainwashed by celebrity, you know, pop culture, right? Like they follow celebrity culture and celebrity culture is blue through and through, you know, Hollywood is blue. And social media, you know, Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok is drastically limiting you know their access to information and so 
it is literally molding their ideology. I think there's been a lot of pressure on the schools too to like, you know, they're all a lot of these people are just fresh out of school or in college and like I'm happy I'm not in college anymore with all this COVID stuff going on and oh, just man. the vaccine and everything. It seems like uh, not a fun time to be going to school. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not yeah, that surprised I'm, I'm either, to be honest. I think uh, it's not surprising that the young kids are voting blue. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, mean, I just... I. Yeah, I come at it from like the 90s, you know, in the 90s when I was a kid, it was always the punk rock thing was to kind of rebel against whatever the mainstream thing is. And it just kind of seems like, you know, the the masks and, you know, all the Democrats, uh, their policies are the mainstream thing. So that's why I was a little shocked. I was just, you know, kind of knowing the children of younger or the nature of younger people who kind of rebel. It's just interesting. Not anymore, Sean. That whole culture ended. Bill and I were talking about this. You know, when we were in UVM together, where we met, there was a huge activist culture still. And it was still very, you know, anti big gov, anti big tech, big pharma, all the major institutions and multinational corporations and warmongers. But you just you really just don't see that anymore. I mean, think about the youth right now. They're all psyched on the war in, on the war in Ukraine. When Bill and I were in college, it was anti-war protests. Right now, they're voting to send more and more money f for war. So, you know, the student body does not stand up against big tech, big gov, big pharma anymore. Not at all, hmm. which is extremely scary. I think that's one of the most scary things that we're dealing with right now. Sean is like, you know, children are meant to be rebellious. You're right. Like teenagers are meant to be rebellious and like buck against the system. And when they don't, you kind of feel a little bit worried. You know, you say they're just going along with the narrative. Yeah, and I think that there is something about the kind of intersectional ideology that to Gen Z feels rebellious. And so I think maybe they're they're latching on to, you know, they think like their parents and all of the, you know, kind of a typical establishment. Like, I don't think they would consider that intersectional ideology is now like is, is mainstream yet. And so I, yeah, I mean, do you think that there's anything to that idea that they actually do feel that like evolving our language and evolving all of these gender norms, like that's their rebel. Yeah. Nature. I could, you yeah. know, I could, yeah, yeah. That's like their, their flag. Right. Yeah. That's interesting. And, yeah. And you do see it. I mean, you hear stories, you know, people that, you know, kids are in school, younger kids and, you know, they're they're identifying as non-binary. They're you know, they're kind of parroting some of the the newer intersectional talking points. So, yeah, I mean, you know, you could be right. That could be their rock and roll, you know. Um, so, yeah, well, I mean, but, you know, a, yeah, because it's a there's kind of a whole fashion element. You know, there's a style feels you know whatever you want to say like if you look at like punk rock fashion punk rock fashion was very it is actually somewhat similar to you know what you see with like antifa it's like black leather you know colored hair kind of and and, and there is some overlap there like i i remember yeah like when we were at uvm a lot of the people that we were protesting against the war with, like you sort of had the, it wasn't called Antifa back then, but it was very much like the same group of like black block, like anarchists. And I mean, Matt, you remember we would go to those potlucks. <laughs> those were like the, those were like the socialists that we associated with though. Right. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah, they weren't, they weren't our main posse. We actually didn't even really, like them. No, 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 no. I know, but 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 they at least would participate in anti-war back then. Oh, for sure. Yeah, they were there. Yeah, exactly. That was the difference. That yeah. was the major difference. And uh, they also weren't. I mean, it wasn't like violent the way that Antifa is. You know. Yeah, it was more like civil disobedience, but like not going too far. No, we weren't and throwing bricks through windows and like burning down random people's cars and, you know. So I think that the question really becomes like with, you know, 
new social media, minds.com, other kind of emerging free speech social apps, like part of the struggle with the youth, because the youth drives technology adoption typically. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of have this really big problem when they're sort of like demanding censorship and surveillance like on, on TikTok or, you know, and, and like that's where they're flocking towards. And, you know, but that being said, you will randomly see like almost like anonymous kind of shit posting apps become really popular, which is a Reddit. little bit more kind of and edgy so like so, so sometimes you'll see stuff like that go viral which i think we have you know on minds like people definitely appreciate the anonymity and the memes and and that kind of thing but i i think that there's a whole maybe there's is the split within the youth of kind of the edgier types and then the more pc types but it definitely feels like the overwhelming mainstream is like not into um into like dark comedy and stuff. Right. Right. Yeah. And this is kind of the proof, you know, like that's, that's what I thought was interesting about this is like, you can actually see the numbers instead of people just, you know, guessing, <laughs> you know? So. Yeah. I think it's really interesting what kind of Matt was saying. It, it seems like there has been like almost like some reversal or something like the, the old, when we were growing up, the, the lefties are, are now kind of the, the righties i know it's like i know like the people who are against big tech and big pharma and big wall street big bank like that used to be the left but now it's the right <laughs> like why did that happen <laughs> why, yeah, like, we, what yeah. happened there i don't actually understand what happened well they, yeah, still, people just start calling themselves the other thing or like intersectionality intersectionality it became a thing where you know if you believe in the black lives matter movement you also have to believe in the vaccine you also have to believe in the transgender movement you also have to believe in gay right all that stuff got packaged in together and so these well, people that just goes to the whole problem of the two parties it's like yeah you know it's like mm -hmm. dude it's like my sister gabriella she she's like hyper liberal right now but before black lives matter and before covid she she was very anti-pharmaceutical. She went to massage school because she realized the mainstream medical industry was messed up. She wanted to go into alternative healing, super hippie kind of girl, right? And all her friends are like that too, like very hippie. They were like down to earth studying herbalism. She went to herbalism classes. But then six, since the vaccine came out and since intersectionality, suddenly she's pro-pharmaceutical. This is what's happened to so many people. Guys, I've got a 3 -third. I'll let, I'll let you wrap up. Okay. Mine's All right, Bill. Slide. You got me. You guys finish Bill. up for a couple. Yeah. Follow Bill. Uh, Bill double booked on us. He has another podcast. Um, but yeah, <laughs> I um, I understand. I I get all that. But what's interesting to me, it's like you know, thinking about um, just kind of thinking about the the people that have been mislabeled. We kind of talked about this on the show yesterday. Like the Matt Walsh Joe Rogan interview was a great example of the 90s liberal and the traditional conservative like you kind of you you got to see the nuance between the two positions um but the problem is like today the 90s liberals or the people that don't necessarily support the new thing get automatically lumped as conservatives and that's not true you know and like that's i think that's the other thing there's just there's a lot of labels lost in translation in 2022 yeah I mean, yeah. all the all the individual issues like are so complex and nuanced and difficult. Yet we just use these left and right, red and blue. Yeah, you know. yeah, yep. sure. We have to separate each issue. Did Don't... you guys see the memes going around on the libertarians? Like everybody's no. just shitting, shitting on them because it's like all of the like voting results would show like the red guy with a lot of votes, the blue guy with a lot of votes. And then like, there'd be like a, a libertarian third guy with like 60,000 votes that like yeah, yeah. was the difference between like, you know, re red winning or blue winning or whatever. And they wouldn't even give the libertarians like a, an avatar. Like it would just be a faceless thing. And 
it's just like well and <laughs> like it's it's interesting right yeah i know we, we had other things we we're going to talk about but i think there is a problem with that like third party system why is it always or the third parties why do they always you know in such a minority um it's interesting, you know, when Tulsi, it was, it was Tulsi, it was Brett Weinstein's project. It was Tulsi and was it Yang? I forgot who was it Tulsi and Yang. I forgot the, um, you guys know what I'm talking about Brett Weinstein's. Uh, oh, he did the Unity. Uh, Unity the Unity, thing. yeah, Unity. And then they got, they ended up getting censored by tech and they weren't allowed to get their message out, which was kind of crazy to me. It's like, yeah, why? How, how dare you try to create Unity? It literally was a hashtag Sense. like Unity Twenty Twenty or something. Unity and it, got, yeah. it got censored. <laughs> like, it got censored. It's like uh, it's like all right, let them get to the polls, let them show the numbers or whatever. But like you didn't even get that far. Like they were just like censored. Like that's an issue in my opinion. Like what? well, Yang's trying to start like the forward party, which is like all about Discord, and I actually like the the values behind it. But it's just too bad. Like everybody's kind of just accepted this two party thing and like everyone yeah. thinks a third party is just a waste of time and it kind of is right now. Um but how did you know that seems like one of the core issues to me, just the two party mm -hmm. like tribal nature. It's like we're gonna probably end up having Biden versus Trump again. Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know, well, that's a funny thing, right? Like Trump was the anti-establishment candidate, but he still ran for the Republicans. It's like he would have been a perfect example of someone that, you know, third party would have been an interesting scenario, right? Um, but I obviously he knows and is politically intelligent to side on, you know, pick one of the sides just because you know there's like a there's a base that right. you can come in right yeah it it's just always it's always interesting to me like wh when will the third party option ever be viable you know and now that tulsi's independent i love tulsi i think she's fantastic i hope she runs again you know can she run on a independent ticket in 2024 yeah right know. do you guys remember yeah, that uh that famous quote by john adams about the two-party system? No. no. It was like, uh, there is nothing which I dread so much as a division of the Republic into two great parties, each arranged under its leader and concerting measures in opposition to each other. This, in my humble apprehension, is to be dreaded as the greatest political evil under our Constitution. Mm. John Adams in 1780. You know, and so the founding yeah. fathers were aware that, you know, Two parties is really no difference. A two party, well, yeah. you can't really call that democracy when you just have a choice between two options. It's like, it's like taking two fascists and just saying, okay, you have you have an option between one or two fascists. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah no, it's, it's it's interesting. It's sad and like so sad. I don't know. It takes like a special kind of person to even want to run for a president these days. So like, you know. That limits the options to begin with. Like, uh, it's just like too bad. I, it, if it's Biden versus Trump again, like it's just, just this sad in my opinion. The Democrats are not going to run Joe Biden again. <laughs> I think they might. I mean, given the I results think... here, like who who else are they going to run? And like right. Trump has such a big ego that I have a hard time seeing him like bowing down to like DeSantis or something, even though he probably should. But yeah, and he, he's, he, he's, he's got good. such a big ego that, like, I guarantee he's gonna try to bully his way into the the ticket again. So yeah, be that's interesting to see. Yeah, that's the first time in our lives, then, right, where we'd have a rematch. Like, mm. or have we had a presidential rematch? Yeah, I think it would be the first time in our lifetimes. That's a good question. That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, no, that and I, yeah, the last thing, Jack and Jack, really want to get your your opinion on this. So this is a big story today. Uh, Meta and it sounds like Amazon as well are laying off thousands of employees, um, which is scary. Yeah. Like in a, in an economy that's not doing well, in, you know, with gas prices the way they are, and with how much you know everything's you know the inflation and costs going up. Like, you know, what is this telling us? Is you know is is uh, Zuckerberg's bet on the metaverse paying off or is this like part of the plan? Like what, you know, what's going on? Yeah, I haven't 
really read too much into Facebook or Meta specifically here, but yeah, I mean, across the board, all of the tech companies are, are doing massive layoffs. And I think like, I don't know, part of it could be just that they like got a little too comfortable when things were going well and like overhired, like you see all these viral videos of like some of the people working at Facebook and the, what they do every day. And it's like, okay, what, like, what is these people are living on vacation land? Like, so I think that there was a ton of like excess that these companies had that they didn't need. Like look at Twitter, like they fired Elon fired like half the company and like, you know, do you even notice anything? Like, no. So like, I do think these companies got a little comfortable with just how things are going. But yeah, I mean, times, times are tough right now. This doesn't help. And there's a lot of people who are getting laid off at the moment. And um, yeah, I mean, Zuckerberg spending billions on the metaverse. So he better hope that that pays off. Um, So this was, I want to, I wanted to pull it. Oh yeah. This is kind of what, this is what I meant. Yeah. Yeah, These are are hilarious. I can't even tell if they're serious or not, but I it's think like, it, it feels like is. a joke almost. I think it is. It almost, I mean, yeah. it almost does feel like a joke, but now I think it's real here. I'll, I'll start it so everyone can see this. this is, I thought this was very interesting and powerful. Welcome to a day in my life as a Twitter employee. So this past week, went to SF for the first time at a Twitter office, badged in. Honestly, took a moment to just soak everything in. What a blessing. Also started my morning off with an iced matcha from the perch. Then I had a meeting, so quickly scheduled one of these little pod rooms, which were so cool. They're literally noise canceling. Took my meeting, got ready for a bunch. Look how delicious this food looks. Oh my goodness, I was so overwhelmed. Then made my way down to this log cabin area. I don't know what this is, but it was really cool. Played some foosball with my friends to kind of unwind a bit. Um, Also found this really cool meditation room that I thought was super neat. Um, I didn't do any yoga, but they have this yoga room if you were a yogi. So also thought that was really cool. Um, Had a couple more meetings in the afternoon, had a ton of projects that we needed to knock out. Say hi to my teammates um went to the went to the library to kind of get some more work done obviously had to have our afternoon coffee so made some espresso and then before leaving for the day had some red wine um that's on tap went up to the rooftop and just honestly enjoyed the beautiful weather so awesome trip so you guys uh Uh, You guys Ooh. picked the wrong company to work at for mine. I, <laughs> Jack, when are when are we gonna get these yeah, uh, I these amenities? I want I want a three star or four star lunch every day. Um, yeah, no, I I saw them like, you know, even I I've been I've been with companies that you know make hundreds of millions of dollars a year, like big money, you know, companies that don't do this, you know, like this just seems. You know, the wine, the coffee, the food, the 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 morning thing, you know. Well, that's <laughs> like, what I mean. That's how it is at a so lot of these tech good. companies. So I think the layoffs are partially a reflection of, like, the economy and, like, all of their stock, their market caps are all cratered, like, insane amounts. So, like, that definitely has to do with it. But, again, like, I think they, they just were getting a little carried away, like, with this type of stuff. Like, this, you don't need any of this for, like, twitter to run but it does attract people to come work there i mean it looks pretty nice (laughs) but um yeah i don't know the layoffs are sad i I never like seeing that even even with the evil empire facebook so uh hopefully if there are any smart people uh for meta are uh looking for a job and want to do better things to the world you know hit me up (laughs) yeah come over to mine's Matt, any thoughts on that before before we wrap? No, I'll just think that's a really tall pour of wine that she has. <laughs> yeah. Ten on tap is like uh, I don't I don't know if I've that's a half that. an eight ounce glass, dude. That's a yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Fire all these lousy bums. <laughs> yeah, honestly, <laughs> so, well, it, it's, it's yeah. just so lousy that whole yeah the whole employment over at that company, man. As soon as I saw that Project Veritas video where they were talking about how everybody here is 
communist as fuck. We hate Republicans. We hate conservatives. And admitting yeah, the that thing is, this is not a communist of, lifestyle, you know, like not at all. <laughs> like this is. This well, is, that's how the Communist Party lives. The, the elite, the elite live like that, no matter what political system there is. All right. communism is this one group of people taking everybody else's wealth and distributing it amongst a different core elite. That's all it is. It's not as though there's no more wealthy people. Right. The government, well, the new uh, government just comes and kicks your door in and takes all your wealth and keeps it for themselves. Yeah. Well, yeah, everyone, thanks for joining us. Um, if you got any items that you want us to cover, definitely let us know in the comments. Um, otherwise, yeah, thanks again. Jack, Matt, thanks for being here. Great. Yep. Thanks. See everyone soon.